Good evening and a very warm welcome to First Issues. Every once in a while there are newspaper headlines that try to alert us to the fact that food safety in Botswana is an important topic. Yet somehow it has failed to become a burning issue of public discussion. This lack of appreciation as to the severity of the problem can probably be attributed to, and I quote, the paucity of data on the magnitude of foodborne illness in developing countries. And it is not helped by cultural beliefs such as and economic constraints that limit the choices people can make when it comes to purchasing their food. Whatever the reason for this continued nonchalance when it comes to food safety, tonight we will attempt to raise the level of awareness on common national practices that are negatively impacting the health of Botswana and the economy. Later on in the show, we conclude our running conversation with Professor Roman Grinberg, this time touching on the factors affecting job creation in the country. Last week, he said he would be reluctant to take on the task of reforming the beef industry. But tonight, he indicates that tackling unemployment is a role he would keenly take on. Sit back, relax and enjoy. At a meeting in April this year, the Acting Deputy Permanent Secretary for Preventive Health Services, Dr. Haruna Baba Jibril, said there's urgent need for all to put in measures to improve food safety. He said safe and nutritious foods could significantly improve the health and well-being of individuals and the population, as well as decrease chronic disease and associated healthcare costs for society. He noted that 70% of the 1.5 billion episodes of diarrhea in the world annually were caused by biological or chemical contamination of food. Despite what you may first assume, diarrhea is not a trivial illness. The World Health Organization estimates that 1.5 billion children under the age of 5 suffer from diarrhea annually and over 3 million die as a result. And its economic impact is illustrated in a 2011 study by the UK Food Standards Agency which showed that the nearly 17 million cases of stomach upsets in the country every year result in about 11 million lost working days. The study acknowledges that the figure could be much higher as for every case recorded in national surveillance there are another 147 because not every case is reported to healthcare services and many people recover without seeking medical help. In the United States where better records of such matters are kept, 48 million cases, 3,000 deaths and 128,000 hospitalizations from foodborne illnesses pose a 77.7 billion economic burden annually. Tonight we do our part in driving home the need for improved food safety practices and speak to environmental toxicologist Dr. Buntlem Bongwe for guidance in this matter. Thank you for staying with us as we now get into our conversation with Dr. Mbongwe on food safety practices in Botswana. Beginning with a working definition of what exactly we are talking about when we refer to food safety and all the considerations made. Food safety is a very complex uh, matter because usually people think of food safety in terms of uh, maybe just hygiene, but you have to think of food safety right from uh, the source where the food comes from until you eat that food. In between the production of that food, there's preparation at that source and there's the food going now to the shops, if that's where you're going to get it, and there's a place now at your house, what you do with the food and how you store it before you eat it or how you store it after you eat it. So it, it involves a whole lot of processes. In that process, there's an issue of um, microorganisms that could uh, be found in that food, either from the source or you introduced those microorganisms when you are saving the food or preparing the food. Or there could be chemicals in that food that could have been from the pesticides or the fertilizers that were used 
um, in the production of that food or the chemicals uh, or even heavy metals that you'll find in the packaging of that food because it's, it has to be packaged. So we have to think of now when you package that food and then storage, how you're going to store that food. If it's food that is supposed to be stored cold or is it supposed to be stored hot? If it has to be cold, keep it, hot, keep it cold. If it's hot, keep it hot. It can be anywhere in between because this is where you are going to now introduce microorganisms. Um, and also the storage things that you are going to use, for example, um, nowadays we are so used to uh, plastic containers and then you take it from the plastic container into the microwave. Think of, is that, mic is that plastic? container that you are using, is it micro microwave uh, friendly or safe? Um, and also um, in terms of even where you are going to, the plate that you are going to use, how clean is it? Or um, the chemicals that whatever it is that you are storing your food in have in it, for example, there have been um, instances in other countries where, for example, you will store food in a particular porcelain, a uh, nice porcelain container, mm -hmm. and only to find that uh, the clay that was used in that has got some heavy metal such as lead mm -hmm. and so forth. So it's a whole lot of things that we can talk about when you talk about food safety. A document obtained from the local food control unit shows that the growing number of street vendors, the importation and sale of expired or unlabeled food products, food scavenging from dump sites for resale to the public, ignorance of food safety issues by most members of the public and some food processors or manufacturers are all serious matters of concern locally. What other practices should we be concerned about? There are so many things uh, that we need to be aware of um, to avoid, you know, problems of food poisoning, either from bacteria or from uh, chemicals in food. There are so many practices um, in, in Botswana, uh, for example, that, that we do. And I'm going to focus myself into uh, or um, food that is prepared during celebrations or whether it's funerals and all that. One is this one where I don't know where it comes from, where when we are preparing food, for example, Honali butternut, we will uh, just prepare it, cut it and then put it back in, into its, the, the sack where it comes from and then put it in, into a pot and boil it. I don't know where this comes from, but upon asking, I was told that we do that because we don't want, we want the butternut to come out really nice, uh, not watery. Oh, listen, mate, And and I've always asked my, the question, what is wrong with that butternut when it is uh, loose? Um, because in the first place, what the explanation is, when you put it in that sack, then you are going to take out the sack, mm. hang it on a tree, so that the water can drip off. Uh, and, and therefore, then you will just take it out of the bag and mash it. Then it looks very nice and creamy, according to those who, who do that practice. Mm. Unfortunately, when the water drips, you are losing nutrients, certainly. Mm. But what is even said is that when you cook uh, butternut in a, pla the bag or the sack is made out of plastic. Some plastics have got a chemical called bisphenol A, or when you look at plastic products, they will usually be written BPA free. Mm. Now, bisphenol A is a, is a chemical um, that really can cause a whole lot of 
um, bad effects on a person. First, it affects, um, it may affect a de de developmental growth of children because it gets absorbed into uh, your system and therefore if you are, say, expecting a baby, some of these chemicals will reach the baby and all that. It also um, affects, you know, the, the brain. That's why it affects uh, the developmental growth of the child and a whole array of, of, of problems that are currently being studied. That's the chemical in the plastic itself. Now again, the, the sec that is used also is painted to match the color of the butternut. So that's paint. Paint itself has got some heavy metals. It could be lead, it could be cadmium, all these chemicals, again, affect the brain. They also affect um, developmental growth uh, of children, even reproduct, they have got reproductive effects. So unfortunately, people do this because they want the butternut to look nice and creamy. What they don't know is the chemicals that they are introducing into the butternut. That's one uh, a practice that is very common. I've also heard that other people, Babariki Samidi, they also uh, use the sacks. They just put the, 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 the millis in the sack and then they boil it in a drum. Mm. Now, the reason why we've got cooking pots and we have to be careful about the cooking pots that we, we use is because cooking pots have also got, got to be safe. Now, if you use a drum, for example, go stationing or ubidisa medica on one we don't know what that drum the original contents of that drum it could have been containing a very hazardous chemical um, there have been instances for example that i can give where we've we've had people dying uh, in a in a or, or falling uh, or, or having uh, some critical condi conditions because they were in a funeral or in, at a wedding and um, the traditional brew was made in a drum or a plastic container that initially the original con uh, contents of that container were some hazardous chemical. Mm. So, but I have to be aware that you cannot just take any container and put food in it or prepare food just anyhow because it's a container. I've also observed in one instance in a there was a uh, some celebration uh, in my uh, in at some relatives place and I've seen people take corrugated iron sheets disang and they were preparing the papata the point is, some of the Senkezo need to be And the other issue is that the Senke themselves deny some chemicals. Some of them may be, I mean, like some have got zinc and then iron, and there are other mixtures in those. Now, Honestly, even though I may need iron in my food, mm. I don't think I need that from the corrugated iron sheet because there are other um, um, additives uh, that have been put in that uh, thing. I would rather cook. So these are some of the practices that could potentially um, harm Botswana. We'll continue our series on food safety in the weeks to come, looking at issues such as the chemicals to look out for in the food you buy, the microorganisms that can contaminate food, as well as looking at best practices in the purchase, storage and preparation of food. Now for our final segment with yet another academic, this time interrogating the matter of job creation in Botswana. Many times the question as to why a middle-income country with just 2 million people is still struggling with income inequality and joblessness has been asked. 
And although the need for the private sector to become the engine for economic growth has been identified, business advocates such as the Botswana Confederation of Commerce, Industry and Manpower consistently complain that an inflexible, sluggish bureaucracy is inhibiting the business environment. We conclude our running conversation with Professor Roman Grinberg, this time touching on the factors affecting job creation in the country. Clearly, uh, the, the private sector uh, complains quite correctly that the quality of, uh, of, uh, of graduates, whether it's from school or university, isn't up to their needs. But uh, you could hear that complaint virtually in every country uh, in, in, in the world. Uh, we we uh, have had for five or six years, if you cut out the Apalacheng, uh, almost no growth uh, in employment in, in Botswana. It's not the mismatch that's causing the unemployment. There's just no jobs out there. I mean, I, the number of, of poor kids I have coming to, to me with university degrees uh, wanting, wanting to be interns for, to work for 1,300 pula a month, uh, it, it, it breaks my heart. Um, um, could they have been better trained? Certainly, but that's not the problem. These are smart kids. They're not dummies. There's just n no jobs out there. And the reason is really straightforward. Because of the diamonds, we had the wealth to continue an old African model that the state led in creating jobs for, uh, for, for, for people. Uh, and that model's over. Uh, the state isn't creating those jobs anymore. And there isn't the private sector creating them because we, we really don't have an environment that's uh, particularly conducive uh, to investment. We don't have a cost structure. Uh, and, um, and until we do, uh, we're not going to win. We're going to lose. With all the efforts that have been made to make us more attractive to investment, how are we failing? How do we still have an environment that's not conducive? Uh, the, the macro environment is, is, uh, is, is reasonably conducive. It's not the macro environment, it's the micro environment, the microeconomics. Um, uh, we uh, have become more inward looking uh, as, a, as a nation. Um, we don't want foreigners, we're kicking out foreign businessmen who've been here for years and years. This is a tragic mistake. All right? Um, the, the word is, uh, isn't that Botswana is open for business, it's closed for business. I look at my own personal experience. I, I can get into Botswana easily. I have a PhD in economics from an Ivy League North American university. Uh, I've written a score of books. And yet, you would have been better off with my dad. My father was, a sem was literate, but just. But he was to his heart an entrepreneur. He created thousands of jobs, all right? But you know, you would never, ever have accepted him because he didn't have a PhD, he didn't have qualifications, all right? And I think the attitude to, uh, uh, towards for, uh, foreign investors and foreigners is becoming uh, very negative here. Uh, and you hear it continually from uh, uh, Botswana investors. And the government doesn't seem to be willing to address this. But there are so many things that are, are so easy to address if they just have the will to do it. Uh, we have landlords that barely make the slightest bit of logical sense. Right? They need to be revised and reformed and brought into the 21st century. We have so many of our laws and so many of our regulations that are not conducive to doing business. I, 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 don't, I, I think what's happened is we're living in, in the past. Um, uh, and there are countries out there, they are really edgy. They want investment. I, I have investors coming to me and saying, I'm, I'm leaving Botswana. So we're going to, I'm going to South Africa because I can't get work permits for, for people that I need. Um, just everything I want to do is so difficult here. I go to South Africa, they fall over themselves. As long as I create jobs, they don't care. He says, you want 100 work permits? We'll give them to you. Just create the jobs. Attitude, it's your attitude that determines your altitude. All right? It's an old American aphorism. Mm. If you've got an attitude like that, I can tell you what your altitude's going to be, flat. Right? We need to change our attitude to the way in which we look 
uh, at that big world out there. We're part of it. All right? we, should, we should be embracing it, all right? not, not trying to hide away from it by cutting ourselves more and more off. And that's, that's the message that the, the business community is getting. Not that things are great, but things are becoming more and more difficult. So those you think are the main reasons in which why we're seeing unemployment and no job creation? Or are there more? If you gave me a job that I wanted, all right, it would be to run uh, industrial policy here. That's the hardest job in this country because I really think uh, I, could, I cr could create thousands of jobs in this country. If, if you gave me the right to run um, a, a real commercial export processing zone uh, right on the border at Tlokwing, all right, mm. and we poured money into it, all right, real money, uh, to, uh, the, uh, for something that's genuinely commercial, I'm sure I could create lots and lots of jobs, thousands of them, mm. all right? But there's no will. I mean, how many years have we been talking about an export processing zone? It's five years now. And uh, ask, ask the Ministry of Trade why it hasn't happened. I think they'll point you towards the Ministry of Finance, all right? It, it, the problem is we have the policy, there's a policy statement, <laughs> there's no export processing zone. We need a, a place where businessmen can invest, all right? There are 3,000 export processing zones in the world, roughly. Most of them fail because we don't, governments don't give the people who run them the, uh, the right and the ability to conduct policy that's quite different right, from what is conducted internally. I could create jobs that they wouldn't be brilliantly paying jobs, at least not initially. You want to travel that road? Well, the first part of the road isn't paved. All right? It's really rough. It's bush track. Okay? Beyond that, you get to Singapore. All right? Singapore is a classic story. I mean, here's a country that was a poor little island with no resources whatsoever. It's the sixth richest country on earth now. And of its five million residents, only three million are citizens. They don't care. If you've got skills, if you've got what we need, you are welcome in Singapore. That's not the attitude in Botswana. Has Botswana become complacent after years of prosperity? Is a country lacking the hunger to take the drastic actions necessary to resolve the challenges within its economy, as our guest has alluded? Share with us your views on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. Until next week and another issue of interest, I'm Nameto Samakula, the team behind First Issues, and our sponsors, First National Bank, wish you a good night and pleasant viewing.